A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy for the day 4th of September 2021. So displayed below are the list of news articles that we will be discussing in today's discussion and they are provided along with the page numbers of different editions and also the link for the handwritten notes in PDF format and also the time stamping of different articles is provided in the comment section as well as in the description box. So without wasting much time, let's get into our discussion. Now see this news article. This news article talks about a recent discovery by a team of paleontologists. And for those who have not heard the word paleontologist, see they are a group of people who study the evidence of prehistoric life. So when I say prehistoric life, it means that it includes the life of plants and animals other than that of humans. Now the recent discovery is that these a group of paleontologists have found the footprints of three dinosaur species in the Thar Desert region. So this is basically the crux of this news article. Now having this in the background we are going to learn some important facts that you need to know about dinosaurs and we are also going to learn about the era or the time period in which this particular species existed. So first of all uh, you should know that dinosaur is a reptile and as we know reptiles they generally walk on four legs except for snakes and this dinosaurs they are a specific subgroup of the archosaurs. In addition to these dinosaurs the archosaurs group they contain or they include crocodiles and birds also and if you look back the first sufficient complete specimens of dinosaurs was first discovered during the 19th century only and this discovery that was made in the 19th century it actually revealed that some dinosaurs were also bipedal so when I say bipedal it means that they walk on two legs instead of on all four legs like that of other reptiles so by now we know that dinosaurs are reptiles and they are a subgroup of archosaurs and we also know that they are bipedal having learned that now let us see when this particular species existed see the dinosaur species they existed or they lived in the mesozoic area and this is the reason why this mesozoic era is also called as the time of the dinosaurs and I think obviously everyone would have known that each era is split into several smaller parts known as periods or epochs. So likewise even this Mesozoic era is split into three periods. So basically this Mesozoic era spans for about 252 to 66 million years ago and the era includes three periods and the three periods are the Triassic period the Jurassic period and the Cretaceous period. So when I say Triassic period, see this period extended from 252 to 201 million years ago and this Triassic period marks the beginning of the age of dinosaurs. Okay, so the existence of dinosaurs are said to begin from the Triassic period. Now after Triassic period comes the Jurassic period which is spanning from 201 to 145 million years ago and following that towards the end comes the Cretaceous period that spans from 145 to 66 million years ago. Now here you should remember that dinosaurs lived from the late Triassic period until the end of the Mesozoic era that is at the end of the Cretaceous period. So this means that the dinosaurs they went extinct about 65 million years ago. So basically on the whole the dinosaurs they existed for about 165 million years. Now here you should understand one thing. See all the dinosaurs they did not live at the same time. Okay, which means different dinosaur species, they lived during different periods. Say, for example, some would have lived during the Triassic period and then some would have lived during the Jurassic period and then some species would have lived during the Cretaceous period. So, on the whole, they did not live at the same time. Now say for example uh, when you take the Stegosaurus dinosaur, they lived during the Jurassic period. Similarly, when you take the Tyrannosaurus dinosaur, it was a species from the Cretaceous period. Okay, so this is uh, one basic thing that you need to keep in mind. Now another thing, 
is that just like how different species belong to different periods similarly there are also different types of dinosaurs also uh, such as theropods sauropods and ornithopods and a picture of them along with a brief description is given below in the form of a picture so we can have a look at it and read it also now coming back one more important fact about the dinosaurs is that they lived on all the continents okay so they were not limited to any particular area as such they were evenly distributed on all of the continents so by now we have a kind of conceptual clarity about the basic facts related to the dinosaurs and also we are clear about the era in which they lived so now let's come back to the news see um, as we saw three footprints of dinosaurs were found by the paleontologist and the found footprints are said to be 200 million years ago and these three footprints they are said to belong to three different species of dinosaurs namely the eubrontis of giganteus the eubrontis glenrosensis and the grelator tenuis and according to the news all these three species they belong to the early jurassic period and also they are considered to be of the theropod type so as we saw earlier theropods are nothing but they are bipedal and these dinosaurs they had an end feet with only three toes and also they are carnivorous okay and one more important fact that is mentioned in the news is that these footprints have been found in the jaisalmer district of rajasthan that is or specifically in the thar desert now this particular discovery it gains importance because this discovery proves the presence of the giant reptiles in the western part of the rajasthan and with this we have come to the end of this particular news discussion So having all these points in mind now let us move on to the next news article Now for our next discussion we have chosen this article see this news article mentions about the red haired slider turtle that has been found in a dam in the Idukki district of Kerala and this discovery has raised concerns because this particular turtle that is the red haired slider turtle is an invasive species So in this slide let us see some important points about this red-eared slider turtle and also the reasons as to why they are called an invasive species. Now first of all you should have in mind that this red-eared slider turtle is a medium-sized freshwater turtle and these species are native to the Mississippi Valley which is situated in the southern United States. know that this turtle is an opportunistic omnivore so being an opportunistic omnivore it survives on a wide variety of plants and animals and its diet may include snails terrestrial insects crustaceans small vertebrates etc but however the small ones are mainly carnivorous and as per studies it is only as they grow older they become partially herbivorous now more importantly This species can live for about 40 years. So therefore even if reproduction does not occur in this species, still they can be found to survive in the wild for many years. Now when talking about the habitat, see within its natural range, this species lives in a wide variety of freshwater habitats including rivers, lakes and ponds. And particularly this species it prefers large quiet water bodies. with soft bottom and those with an abundance of aquatic plants and in addition to that these species are also highly adaptable so which means they can tolerate anything such as brackish water in fact these species can even thrive in dams that have been polluted by excessive organic matter and similarly they can also tolerate radioactive thermal chemical as well as organic pollution and most importantly This species has also got the potential to adapt itself to subtropical and tropical areas and an adult species can even survive severe winters through hibernation. Now see this particular species is small in size and they have simple husbandry or breeding requirements. And not just that they could also be obtained in low price. So because of all these factors this particular red eared slider turtle has become one of the world's most commonly traded live reptile and it is mainly used as a pet and in addition to that they are also farmed for food purposes in the philippines china and malaysia 
so in this way these turtles they easily become invasive species in other ecosystems and at present they are found in various countries or regions in Europe Asia Australia and Africa this species has got the potential to easily get into the wild because once they become larger the pet owners they automatically release them and additionally millions of red eared sliders have also been released into the wild in Asia for buddhist mercy ceremonies so having said all these now let's see how these species pose threat to the environment so first of all these species they impact indigenous habitats because of their omnivorous diet and because of their ability to adapt to various habitats so secondly they also cause reduction in native biodiversity and also they have negative impacts on native turtles and aquatic ecosystems in general see this is because these species are very aggressive and they compete with indigenous species for food nesting as well as for basking sites and thirdly they release into the natural ecosystem actually increases the risk of parasite transmission to native species and in addition to that they also affect humans since salmonella which is a type of bacteria can be transferred to humans when drinking water has been contaminated by turtles so it is due to all these reasons that this particular red-eared slider turtle is known as a successful invasive species and even hiu cn has listed this red-eared slider among the 100 examples of the world's worst invasive species and therefore its import is banned in many countries so so these are some important points that you need to remember when you learn about the red-eared slider turtle now we are going to discuss about this government ad that is published in the Thiruvananthapuram edition now this ad it talks about the Jammu and Kashmir tourist village network that was launched under the mission youth and for those who are not aware see this mission youth is an initiative of the government of Jammu and Kashmir and through this initiative the government aims to provide a vibrant medium for the youth engagement and they also pay for their empowerment now let's very briefly know about this tourist village initiative see through this particular initiative the government is aiming to transform 75 villages of Jammu and Kashmir into tourist villages so for this purpose they will be choosing those villages which are known for their historical picturesque beauty and also those which are known for their cultural significance and after choosing the villages they will transform the chosen villages or they will promote the chosen villages into a tourist village by showcasing their inherent characteristics like that of their landscapes then their indigenous knowledge systems or their cultural diversity and heritage or even their local values and traditions and besides this the government will also be encouraging film shooting in such areas in order to bring them to the limelight and so on that line they will be offering financial incentives as well so as we saw earlier this uh, particular tourist village network is launched under mission youth so under this mission youths initiative uh, both registered youth as well as self help groups will be given the opportunity to be a part of the government's endeavor to transform the chosen villages of jammu and kashmir into tourist villages and as you can see here a special incentive of about 8 to 10 lakhs is given for music video or song shootings in the tourist villages that are developed under the scheme and know that this incentive is being provided in addition to the financial assistance that is provided by the government in order to bring these areas into limelight and likewise even a special assistance of up to 2 lakh rupees is said to be provided for those local artists as a means to promote the traditional performing arts and also the local producers and for your additional information the list of this initiatives objectives is given below for your reference so you can just quickly pour through it see as we know Jammu and Kashmir has already got a good position when it comes to the tourist influx so on that line this said youth led sustainable tourism initiative is expected to further strengthen the rural economy and also the community entrepreneurship therein 
and in addition to that it is also expected to empower the youth and also the women by providing both direct as well as indirect employment opportunities so these are some important points about this tourist villages so now let's move on to the next news discussion now for our next news discussion we have taken this news article now this particular article reports about a statement that was made by our indian prime minister while he was addressing the east economic forum and have in mind the east economic forum is now being held at vladivostok which is russian city that is situated in the east coast you can locate the place in the map given below now with this background first let us have a 360 degree analysis of india russia bilateral relations in the discussion and then we will see in brief about the eastern economic forum that is mentioned in today's news the syllabus covered by this article is given below the firstly know that russia has been a long standing and also a time tested partner for india and this strong relationship is evident with both sides signing the declaration on the india russia strategic partnership back in october 2000 and in fact we can see them cooperate in almost all areas of bilateral relationship ranging right from political security defense trade economy science and tech and also in culture now know that the strategic partnership between both countries was elevated to the level of a special and also a privileged strategic partnership only in the year 2010 December during the visit of the then Russian president to India so in simple words both these countries they always have had a robust partnership now before going into our discussion let's split up this discussion on the India Russia relationship into five different parts with each part covering the different angles of the India Russian bilateral So in the first part let us see some of the important multilateral organization and some important connectivity projects in which both India and Russia are partnering. Now the first and the foremost or the most important one in this regard is the BRICS which is always been one of the recurring topics in news. See this BRICS consists of five major emerging countries which are which includes Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa and the most prominent areas of cooperation under this are in the fields of economy, finance, health, science, technology and also in innovation, security and business. Now the second one in which both the countries are pairing is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization see this Shanghai Cooperation Organization is a permanent intergovernmental organization and its creation was announced back in the year 2001 in the month of June at Shanghai in China and this said announcement of Shanghai Cooperation Organization was made by six countries and these six countries are the Kazakhstan Kyrgyzstan China Russia Tajikistan and Uzbekistan and remember that on June 2017 both India and Pakistan were made as full time members of this Shanghai cooperation organization so that means at present India is serving as a full time member of this Shanghai cooperation organization and this said organization it mainly focuses on the regional security issues and it also fights against regional terrorism ethnic separatism and also religious extremism now thirdly russia has reiterated its unwavering support to india for the permanent membership in an expanded unsc and finally so know that russia has been a long standing supporter of india's membership of the nuclear suppliers group now having said that let's have a very brief understanding about this nuclear suppliers group see this said nuclear suppliers group is a group of nuclear supplier countries and it seeks to prevent nuclear proliferation i know both the sentences are contradicting and you may be wondering how a nuclear supplier country may seek to prevent nuclear proliferation now the answer to this is these nuclear supplier countries they prevent the nuclear proliferation by controlling the export of materials equipment and technology that can be used to manufacture nuclear weapons and know that 
India was not able to be a member of this elite group due to the opposition from some countries like that of China and the main reason for the opposition is that India has not signed the nuclear non-proliferation treaty because signing this nuclear non-proliferation treaty is a prerequisite for a country to be admitted into this nuclear suppliers group and so it is in this regard that Russia is supporting India for its membership in this nuclear suppliers group. So these are some of the multilateral agreements or arrangements in which India and Russia are partnering and with that we are done with the first part now coming to the second part see in this part we are going to talk about the defense and the security cooperation and in fact India has got a long-standing and also a wide-ranging cooperation with Russia when it comes to the field of defense see initially India-Russia military technical cooperation was in the level of a buyer-seller framework only. But then it was only in the course of time that this cooperation evolved into one that involved joint research, development and also the production of advanced defense technologies and system. And here the BrahMos missile system as well as the licensed production in India of the Su-30 aircraft and the T-90 tanks are some examples of such flagship cooperation. And the two sides also concluded agreements on supply of the S-400 air defense systems and then the construction of frigates under the project 1135.6 and also for manufacturing the Ka-226 T helicopters in India. And here, uh, it is to be noted that the India and Russia, they also hold exchanges and training exercises between their armed forces annually. So, in this regard, India-Russia exercises between the Army, Navy and Air Force of the two countries have been held since the year 2005 and moreover, joint tri-services exercises Indra are also being held once in every two years since the year 2017 and for your additional information the last Indra tri-services exercise was held in India during the year 2019 December and the military exercise was recently conducted in Russia in the beginning of August. Now let us move on to the third part in the India-Russia relationship. See this part is going to be about the trade and economic relations that are shared between the two countries know that India and Russia have revised the targets to increase bilateral investment to about 50 billion US dollars and bilateral trade to 30 billion US dollars by the year 2025 so take a quick look into the import and export items you need not memorize everything but then have in mind at least two or three for the exams and it is also to be noted that the bilateral trade in services has always remained stable during the last five years with the trade balance in Russia's favor. And on that line, a few important steps or a few important projects that could provide a major boost to bilateral trade includes the operationalization of the Green Corridor project and then the International North-South Transport Corridor and also the signing of an FTA or a free trade agreement with the Eurasian Economic Union. And on that line, even the operationalization of the Chennai Vladivostok Eastern Maritime Corridor could also help and now the fourth part of the bilateral ties is going to be about the cooperation in the nuclear energy see russia is an important partner for india in the area of peaceful use of nuclear energy and the kodan kulam nuclear power plant is being built in india with russian cooperation and also know that this kodan kulam nuclear power plant units 1 and 2 have already become operational and the construction of the third and fourth unit is going on and also the credit protocol for the fifth and sixth unit was also signed recently now coming to the last part of the bilateral ties which is going to be space cooperation see in space cooperation both sides they actually cooperate in the peaceful uses of outer space including the satellite launches the GLONASS navigation system the remote sensing and also other societal applications of outer space so on that line and memorandum of understanding was signed by the ISRO and the Roscosmos 
on joint activities in the field of human space flight program and since then the negotiation of contracts and cooperation for realization of the india's human space flight program that is the gaganyaan are taking place so this is a broad overview of the important points that you need to have in mind whenever you learn about the india russia cooperation so now with this understanding let us have a quick run through of the eastern economic forum that was mentioned in today's news See the said Eastern Economic Forum was established by a degree of the president of the Russian Federation that is Vladimir Putin and this forum was established with the aim of supporting the economic development of Russia's far east and also to expand the international cooperation in the Asia Pacific region and remember this forum takes place each year in Vladivostok and with that let's wind up this particular news article and let's move on to the next news article now look at this news article now this particular article it talks about a project agreement that was signed between india and the united states on july 30 and according to the defense ministry this project agreement was signed for an air launched unmanned aerial vehicle and the particular agreement is also said to be signed under the ambit of the defense technology and trade initiative so this is the news now based on this context let us talk about the said unmanned aerial vehicle and let us also see about the mentioned defense technology and trade initiative see first of all in simple words an air launched unmanned aerial vehicle is nothing but a drone which can be launched from an aircraft so we all know that drones are also called as unmanned aerial vehicles and they are also named as unmanned aircraft systems so basically uh, these drones they refer to a flying robot which is navigated from the ground using a gps tracking system now apart from being remotely controlled these drones they've got the capability to fly autonomously through a software controlled flight plan and remember drones they've got the capability of reaching even the most remotest areas that will with little to no manpower in the least amount of effort time and energy and it is because of this unique characteristic the drones are being adopted worldwide especially in crucial sectors like that of military personnel and future technology and also for commercial purposes now on talking about the structure of drones see uh, drones are equipped with a different state of the art technology uh, say like that of infrared cameras gps and also laser and these drones they are usually controlled by a remote ground control systems and also know that usually an unmanned aerial vehicle system will consist of two parts which is the drone itself and the control system and generally the nose of this unmanned aerial vehicle is where all the sensors and the navigational systems are present and apart from the nose the rest of the body of the drone will be filled with technology systems as there is no space required to accommodate any humans there and also remember uh, the engineering materials that are employed in the manufacturing of the drones are generally very lightweight and they are also highly complex that are designed in a way to absorb the vibration which will eventually decrease the sound produced and when you look at the applications of drones know that the drones are used for multiple purposes in a varied range of sectors uh, some examples of popular drones are the attack drones the delivery drones the surveillance drones etc so now let's see some important examples of drones and their application in various fields the first comes the attack drones see these drones are generally used only by the military and they are equipped with weapons which can be used for controlled head strikes and when you take the delivery drones they are being employed as a new way of delivering items to customers and for this purpose they are generally used by some big shipping companies say like that of amazon etc and on talking about the surveillance drones these drones are equipped with cameras and they are used across a number of industries that are for various purposes like that of law enforcement sports then forestry farming etc 
Now, due to their greater efficiency, these drones are also used in the field of agriculture as agricultural drones. And these agricultural drones, they are used for carrying out field surveys and they can also estimate the crop yield and they also keep track of the livestock there. And apart from these, drones are also used for search rescue operations. Now, apart from all these broad areas of application, the drones are also used for search or rescue operations, for geographically mapping an inaccessible terrain or location, and also for building safety inspections, storm tracking, as well as in the field of photography and videography as well. So, by now, we have a basic conceptual clarity on the drones their structure and also their application so now let us move to know about the DTTI or the defense technology and trade initiative that is mentioned in today's news see this said defense technology and trade initiative is a major strategy that is used to facilitate the development of defense technology and under this strategy they facilitate the defense technology by reducing the bureaucratic processes and also by reducing the legal requirements that are needed in all possible ways and for your information this defense technology and trade initiative between united states and india was launched back in the year 2012 and the main aim of this was to bring a sustained leadership focus to promote collaborative technology exchange and in addition to this to also create opportunities for the co-production and co-development of future technologies for the purpose of Indian and US military forces. So on that line under this defense technology and trade initiative joint working groups on land naval air and aircraft carrier technologies have been established in order to focus on the mutually agreed projects in respective domains. Now here you should understand one thing see we cannot call the defense technology and trade initiative as any kind of law or any kind of a treaty but instead it has been given a name of a flexible machinery which will help the senior leaders from the United States of America and also from India to ensure a determined and also a focused approach on channelizing the opportunities and also on channelizing the challenges that are related with the growing the mutual defense partnership and with this let's wind up this particular news discussion and move on to the next news article now have a look at this news article which reports about the financial stability and development council now this financial stability and development council was a news because recently the council met and it discussed a host of issues concerning our economy and the said meeting is the 24th meeting of this financial stability and development council so during the meeting this council deliberated on various mandates like that of financial stability financial sector development then on interregulatory coordination financial literacy financial inclusion and macro prudential supervision of the economy including the functioning of large financial conglomerates and also in the meeting the council stressed on the need for keeping a continuous vigil on the financial sector by the government as well as different regulators. So these are the important points from the news article. So in this context, let us very briefly say about some important facts about the financial stability and the development councils in the preliminary perspective. See, the Financial Stability and Development Council is an autonomous body that was constituted by the government of India and this body was constituted by an executive order of the union government as a non-statutory apex body under the Ministry of Finance back in the year 2010. And also know that this Financial Stability and Development Council, shortly called as FSDC, was created on the recommendation of the Raguram Rajan Committee. I'll repeat on the recommendation on the Raguram Rajan Committee on the Financial Sector Reforms. And this committee was set up in the year 2008. So now let us see about the members of this FSDC. See, first of all, the finance minister is the chairman of the Financial Stability and Development Council. And then 
This council it also includes the heads of financial sector regulators, which includes the heads of the Reserve Bank of India, the Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority, the Securities and Exchange Board of India, and also the Pension Fund Regulatory and Development Authority. And in addition to that, the Finance Secretary, the Chief Economic Advisor, the Secretary of the Department of Financial Services, and then the Ministry of State responsible for the Department of Economic Affairs, and also the Secretary of the Department of Electronics and Information Technology, then the Revenue Secretary, and the Chairman of the Insolvency and the Bankruptcy Board of India are also the members of this FSDC. Now, let us move on to see about the functions of this Financial Stability and Development Council. See, this body it mainly deals with the macro prudential and the financial regularities in the entire financial sector of India. And this body also envisages to strengthen and institutionalize the mechanism of maintaining financial stability, financial sector development, inter-regulatory coordination along with monitoring macro prudential regulation of the economy. So, so far we saw about its function and now let's see about its responsibilities. So some of the major responsibilities of the FSDC are to bring about stability in the financial sector, to develop the financial sector, to coordinate between the inter-regulatory bodies, to promote the financial literacy, to ensure the financial inclusion and apart from this it is also responsible for the macro prudential supervision of the economy including the functioning of the large financial conglomerates and also for coordinating India's international interface with financial sector bodies like the Financial Action Task Force, the Financial Stability Board and any other such body that is decided by the Finance Minister from time to time. So with this we have come to the end of this article discussion. Now let's move on to the next part of our Hindu news analysis. Now see this article. This news article mentions that in Kerala, pink colored ration cards will be provided to more than 1 lakh people. And already ration cards in the Antyodaya Anna Yojana category were provided to 11,230 persons. So this is the news mentioned here. Now with this background, let us learn about these ration cards and also the purpose behind. See, we all know that the government distributes food grains to the poorest section of the society and this process of distributing food grains is called as targeted public distribution system. So, this targeted public distribution system it is done through the government regulated ration shops which is also known as the fair price shops so what they usually do in these fair price shops is that they used to keep stock of food grains sugar kerosene oil etc for cooking and they used to sell these items to people at a lower price than that which is sold in the market so any family with a ration card can buy a stipulated amount of these items every month so having said that, now let's see very briefly on what is a ration card. See, in simple words, a ration card is a card that entitles the holder to get access to food supplies at subsidized rates. So you should know that in our country, the ration card system is devolved to the state level. So this means that each state has got its own system for distributing food to people who qualify for a ration card. So that means there are differences in the way in which ration cards are administered from state to state. But however nationally there used to be three main groups entitled to ration cards or we can say that three main kinds of ration cards existed before and they are the Antyodaya cards, the BPL cards or the below poverty line cards and the APL cards or the above poverty line cards. So each group's card are usually different in color in order to enhance the ease of identification or they are given different colors for identification purposes. So let us see about these cards one by one. Now first comes the Antyodaya cards. These cards are provided under the Antyodaya Anna Yojana scheme. See this scheme 
is designed for the poorest of the poor people or for those people who have no regular income coming into the household so they are even the poorest among the bpl or the below poverty line families and many of the people who fall into this category they include the households who are headed by widows terminally ill persons disabled persons or persons above 60 years and all other primitive tribal households and the process of identifying the antyodaya anna yojana families and also the issuing of distinctive ration card is a responsibility of the concerned state government so now let's see what benefits do people get if they have this particular card so those people who have the aay card or the antyodaya cards they can buy 35 kilograms of food grains per household per month and the food grains are provided at the prices of rupees 3 per kg for rice and rupees 2 per kg for wheat and rupees 1 per kg for coarse grains okay so next comes the bpl and the apl cards or the below poverty and the above poverty line cards see bpl cards or below poverty line cards belongs to those people who are below the poverty line and as the name suggests the apl card or the above poverty line cards is applicable for all others that is for those people who are not included in aay card and the bpl cards so these were the three main ones that were there in existence before the national food security act of 2013 came into force but then after this national food security act the apl that is the above poverty line cards or categories and the below poverty line cards and categories were done with so at present only the eligible households and those households who are covered under the antyodaya anna yojana are entitled to receive food grains under the targeted public distribution system if you remember i mentioned a term called eligible households see these eligible households are also called as priority households and it refers to those families who are not covered under antyodaya anna yojana so usually these priority households they receive the phh or the priority household cards and they are entitled to get food grains of about 5 kg per person per month now apart from this the state governments also they issue color wise ration cards to various qualifying groups but again such cards and the categories of people to which it is provided it varies from state to state for example uh, as it is mentioned in today's news pink ration card is given to the phh or the priority households including the below poverty line families so these are some basic things that you need to have in mind whenever you come across or whenever you learn about the public distribution system so with these details now let us move on to the next discussion now having done with the article discussion let us now move on to the next segment of our hindu news analysis that is the prelims practice question discussion so now let us take up this practice question about the tart dessert three statements are given and we need to find the correct statements now the question goes as which of the following statements is or are correct with reference to tart dessert and statement 1 says that it is spread across two countries and the second statement is that its easternmost boundary limit is the aravalli hills and the third statement says that its landscape is characterized by undulating sand dunes scanty rainfall and extreme temperature now see thar is the great indian desert and it is the eastern limit of the persia arabian desert and this thar desert it extends up to 2.3 million square kilometers in india and pakistan and 85% of this desert is in india and the remaining part is situated in eastern sindh province and some area of the pakistan punjab so basically in india it is spread across rajasthan haryana punjab and the ran of kutch in gujarat so this makes the first statement correct now coming to the second statement see this statement is also right because the thar desert is the only ecosystem of its type in the indian subcontinent 
and its easternmost boundary limit is the Aravalli Hills and its western limit is defined by the fertile plains of the Hindus. And when you take its southern limit, it is the great Ran of Kutch and its northern limits are formed by the riparian sub-Himalayan plains. So this statement is also right. Now moving on to the third statement. See this statement is correct as well because the landscape of the Thar Desert is characterized by undulating sand dunes, scanty rainfall, then extremes of temperature and sparse human population. And it is also the most thickly populated desert in the world with an average density of 83 persons per kilometer. And also it hosts a rich diversity of life. And for your additional information, the Thar Desert includes the Desert National Park Wildlife Sanctuary. And some important species that are spotted in the Thar are the Great Indian Bustard and two species of gyps vulture, namely the Oriental White-backed Vulture and the Long-Built Vulture. So from this we can find that all the three statements that is given here are right and therefore the correct answer here is option D that is 1, 2 and 3. Now look at this practice question. Statement 1. The Prime Minister of India is the Chairman of the Financial Stability and Development Council. And Statement 2. The FSDC or the Financial Stability and Development Council is a statutory body functioning under the Ministry of Finance. See, based on the discussion itself, we can infer that both the statements are incorrect because it is the finance minister who is the chairman of the Financial Stability and Development Council and not the Prime Minister of India. Likewise, this council is a non-statutory body that is functioning under the Ministry of Finance and it is not a statutory body. So, since both the statements that is given here are incorrect, the correct answer here will be option D that is neither one nor now look at this question, IUCN has listed the red-haired slider among 100 examples of the world's worst invasive species. So what are the threats posed by it? Statement 1, they take over nests of water birds. Statement 2, they damage and prey on the eggs and hatchlings of other species. And statement 3, they increase the risk of parasite transmission to native species. And we need to find the correct statements. See, in this question, all the three statements that is given here are correct. Because as we saw in the discussion, these species, they cause reduction in native biodiversity. And there are also considerable evidence that red-haired sliders have got negative impacts on native turtles and also on the aquatic ecosystems in general. Now this is said so because these species are found to be aggressive and they are also found to compete with the indigenous species when it comes to food, nesting and basking sites. Now say for example in Singapore, the red-eared sliders are posing a significant threat when it comes to the survival of the critically endangered river terrapins. So since all the statements that is given here are correct, the correct answer here is option D that is all of the above. Now look at this question. Statement 1 says that the priority households are entitled to get food grains of 35 kilograms per person per month. And statement 2 says that the households covered under Antyodaya Anna Yojana are not eligible to get food grains under the National Food Security Act of 2013. See the first statement that is given here is incorrect because the priority households are entitled to get only 5 kilograms of food grains per person per month and not 35 kilogram. So this statement is wrong. Now coming to the second statement, see as per section 3 clause 1 of the act, that is section 3 clause 1 of the National Food Security Act of 2013, the priority households and the households who are covered under the Antyodaya Anna Yojana are in fact eligible to get food grains and these priority households can get 5 kilograms while the Antyodaya Anna Yojana households can get 35 kilograms per household per month. So this statement again is wrong. Since both the statements are incorrect, the correct answer here is option C, both 1 and 2 because the question wants us to find only the wrong statements. The list of mains questions is displayed below. So interested aspirants can write your answers and post them in the comment section. 
So with this, we have come to the end of today's Indo News analysis. And if you have liked the video, then don't forget to like, comment, and share. And do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for more updates regarding UPSC Civil Services preparation.